Stories are what we live by, what we tell ourselves, what we believe is true. What if I told you that you are loved, desired, and you are made with a purpose? You are accepted. You have a precious soul and you have a meaningful body. You are empowered by God himself to live the rich and abundant life he always wanted for you. You are called into a mission to tell the story of God's love to all the world, and you are destined to be with him forever. This is the true story of what it means to be a person made in the image of God and living by faith in the Son of God. This is what you are longing for. This is who you really are. Why are people important? There was a comic strip not that long ago, a Betty comic strip, in which there were two main people who were looking at a Where's Waldo book. And one of the main characters quickly found Waldo right there behind the tree. And as they're leaving, this is the last scene of the comic strip. The main character says, finding Waldo has always been easy for me. It's myself that I can't find. Doesn't that ring true? I think that for so many of us, we go looking for meaning and purpose and identity, and we don't have a clue where to look. And so we try to make our own meaning or make our own identity. And that's why I want to do a whole series on this question, just who am I? Gregory was a very gentle soul. He was gentle his entire life. Even at the age of 69, when he died alone and forgotten in a jail cell at the women's prison of Dade County, Miami. You heard that right. He had been married four times. He had six kids and he was something of a minor celebrity. He was successful as a pediatrician. Well known, but he was haunted, living in the shadow of his father, and he couldn't win the fight against his alcohol addiction. He lost his medical license, and at the age of 69, Gregory, who was now known as Gloria, died with no comfort, no support except the high heels and died in a women's prison. Gregory had not spoken to his father in 50 years. In 1951, when Gregory was only 19 years old, he was arrested for walking into a bar in drag, and his mother, so overcome by what happened, and already suffering from a stress-related condition, she died the next day. And Gregory's father looked him in the eyes and said, this is all your fault. And for the next 10 years, Gregory would not hear a word from his father until he heard a word about his father, that he had died. He had killed himself in the same way Gregory's grandfather had done before him. Gregory's obituary ran in the Times newspaper because he was famous. He was the youngest son of Ernest Hemingway. And perhaps it's fitting because Hemingway was one of the greatest writers to ever wield a pen. That what happened to him and Gregory was almost scripted. Because you see, Ernest Hemingway himself was hated by his parents. And he returned the favor. His uh, parents were churchgoers, and Ernest was anything but. In fact, he lived his life in a way to let his parents know, I want to live the exact opposite 
of how you think. And his mother, his mother wanted him to know how that made her feel. His mother wanted him to know how that made God feel. And this is how she did it. On one of his birthdays, Ernest Hemingway's mother sent him a cake along with the gun that his father had used to kill himself. She wrote him letters, letters detailing how a good son should act, what kind of duties and requirements are required for him to get into good graces with his parents, and, of course, for God to like him. And as a result, he developed a deep-seated hatred for his parents and for God, and it spilled over into his son. But it's interesting what Hemingway felt deep within his bones. What he wanted to be true, even when nothing on earth told him it was true. Because 1951 is when he stopped talking to his son. But in 1953, Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story about a Spanish father who desperately wanted to reconcile with his son. His son Paco had run away from home. And so now full of sorrow and with a change of heart, the father took out an ad in a national newspaper in Madrid. And the newspaper article read this way, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montana at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Papa. Paco is a very common name in Spain. And so according to the story, the father goes down to the town square and he finds eight hundred young men named Paco waiting for their father. If the world could write of its sense of longing, it would be one sad story. So many of us feel unwanted. For some of you, it started in adulthood when your boss called you a good for nothing or when your spouse said, I can't take you anymore as they dismantled your life and carried it out the door. For some, it started even earlier. In grade school, never picked for the kickball team. Passed over for playing time in favor of the coach's son, who you swear to this day never held a candle to your LeBron-type skills. And for others, it goes even further back. An unplanned pregnancy, an unwanted delivery, an undesired baby. And whether your adopted parents ever told you the story, you have felt the effects all your life. So what do we do? When we sense no purpose, we create purpose. We have to. It's how we're wired. Without purpose, without meaning, without hope, without a sense that we're wanted and our contribution is meaningful, we die. But we know all too well that created self-purpose lasts as long as we find interest in it. And it's as solid as our imagination. And the story that we're being fed by our culture is crushing. Last year at the Harding Lectureship, Jonathan Stormont gave a keynote in which he shared this important message that I want to put on the next slide. Turn on the television. Turn on, listen to any major Grammy award-winning song. Read any short story, any teenage novel. Watch any movie, and this is what you're going to find underlying all of it. It's a story that forms the benchmark for what really is going on in our world. You are a complete accident. There is no inherent meaning. There's no ultimate purpose. It's all entirely self-created. Don't you feel it? You are nothing but an animal. And that means that time and chance are the only things you have to think. And that means that one's sex really has no meaning. It's just a matter of plumbing. 
And that means one's gender has no inherent meaning. It's a social construct. And that, of course, means that having sex has no meaning. It's simply play for grown-ups. And that means love has no meaning. Love is just happiness you feel from a sexual desire. And that means marriage has no meaning. It's just a cultural construct, an antiquated one. It's outdated, and it doesn't really fit with where we are today. And that means fidelity has no meaning. The purpose of marriage is happiness for yourself, not sacrifice. That means divorce has no meaning. It's simply what we do when we lack a sense of happiness. And that may be, it may be bad for the kids, but they need to see you living your truth. And don't go trying to find meaning in that antiquated book called the Bible. That thing's full of sexism and racism and patriarchalism, outdated ideas, and it's nothing but an oppressive tool if you use it against me and a repressive tool if you use it against yourself. Because the point's this. Life is an accident. There is no creator, which means there is no creation. Nature's red in tooth and claw. So feel free to come up with whatever meaning you want to attach to who you are and what you do. And if you can't find a cause in life to give your life to, don't worry. We have prescription medicine, great food, and great entertainment to keep you occupied until you die. It's the story that whether consciously or unconsciously, we are being fed every day. Richard Dawkins tries to explain it in one of his books, and I appreciate the transparency. Quote, the universe at the bottom has no design, no evil, and no other good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. It's a story which we might be telling ourselves. Since there is no objective answer to who am I, I need to look deep within myself to find meaning. But when I look deep within myself, I find a gaping hole, an empty well, and it leaves us sad, hurt, and very confused. And yet we long for meaning. It was Tennyson who wrote, Thou maddest man. He knows not why. He thinks he was not made to die. We go looking for meaning. We go looking for a soulmate. We think we'll find meaning in the right person. That lasts about five minutes. It's always interesting how we play as if relationships of love and trust would somehow be meaningful and fulfilling, but we end up disappointing each other. And then we see our togetherness as nothing but a bitter disappointment for both of us. How could it be otherwise? So we go looking for meaning, maybe not in a person, maybe we'll find it in money or things. But things get old real quick. And money only leads to the need for more money. So we go seeking meaning from validation in other people. But no matter how many slaps on the back we get, we know that what we're really looking for isn't a soulmate or money or validation. What we want is connection. We want to sense that we mean something to someone and that meaning matters. Everyone wants to be wanted. We want to be desired. We want meaning that's deeper than the one that we create for ourselves and what we long for, what we sense deep within our bones, even when nothing on earth tells us it's true, we want it and believe it and desire it to be true, that we were intended, that there is someone for whom we were no accident. What if I told you that you are no accident? You were intended, every single person, a plan of God, chosen 
wanted, made. There are two stories, the story that culture feeds us, and in a culture much like ours, a post-Christian culture, which in many ways resembles a pre-Christian culture, the Bible says, I've got another story for you. This is the true story of a father who wanted children, of an older brother who wanted brothers and sisters. The story of God, his son, Jesus Christ, and his intentional creation. And our story says this, you were intended. Far from being a lump of atoms accidentally coming together as the result of blind workings of a randomless chain of events with no cause, we believe the truth, beauty, and goodness himself made light and said, oh, that's, that's good. He made grass and trees, the skies and the seas, and said, that's good. And when it came time for you, he switches from speaking to creation to using his own hands like a skilled artist. And to you and I, he says, here's the story that leads to you. God said, let us make mankind in our image to look like me. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And after every day, God said it's good. But after he made man and woman, he said it's very good. You are very good in the eyes of your father. Listen to Psalm 139. This is in the contemporary English version. You are the one who put me together inside my mother's body, and I praise you because of the wonderful way you created me. Everything you do is marvelous. Of this I have no doubt. Nothing about me is hidden from you. I was secretly woven together out of human sight, but with your own eyes, you saw my body being formed. You and I weren't just formed. This story says you and I were pre-formed. Even before God knit us together in our mother's womb, he knew us and had a plan for us. Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Or the end of Psalm 139, verse 16. Even before I was born, you had written in your book everything about me. You were no unplanned surprise. Everything about you was intentional. Oh, I don't mean in just some general sense. God wanted humans. You happen to be a human. So by extension, I guess he wanted you too. I mean you. You with your uniqueness. You with all your quirks. You with the parts of you that you think would make people never love you. God wanted you. You with your extreme sensitivity. You with your over-the-top gregariousness. You with your full trophy case. You with your empty trophy case. You with your obedient nature. You with your questioning soul. God designed you with our differences and our loves and our distinctiveness. And when we give in to the wrong story that the culture feeds us, we end up devaluing ourselves. How do you feel when you see someone, maybe in a protest, throwing food or paint on a Van Gogh? Our negative self-talk, our devaluing words and actions do the same thing. You are an original made by the master artist. And he declares us special and beloved the way he made us. You know, children can't help but see the goodness in our differences. 
Jerry Seinfeld says, in kindergarten, it was so easy. You get to kindergarten, you see somebody drinking cherry soda, and you say, you like cherry soda? I like cherry soda. We'll be friends forever. It was so easy then. G.K. Chesterton, one of my favorite writers, says, we can learn something from watching children. It's possible, says Chesterton, that God says every morning to the sun, do it again. He says to the moon every night, do it again. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all the daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be, says Chesterton, that he may have the eternal appetite of infancy. For we have sinned and grown old, but our Father is younger than we are. You and all your difference, you and your beautiful strangeness, you are an image bearer of God. Do you believe that? I'm not just talking about Christians. The story of creation is a story about every person under heaven. Warts and all. We know that not everything we choose for ourselves is good. We know, and we're going to get to that. I want you to know in this series, we're going to talk about what it means to have a soul, what it means to love our bodies, what it means to be empowered, what it means to be accepted, and our calling to join God in his mission, and why. Living by a different story means seeing ourselves in a different light, which means acting differently than we normally would. But right here, right off the bat, I want you to hear something from this church as we echo this story that we've been given by God. God loves you. He loved you and you had nothing to offer him. He wanted you and he wants you still. And nothing you do, nothing you have done, and nothing you plan to do can change this fact. God loves you, and he wants you with an everlasting love and an everlasting intention. I'm not sure if we hear that enough. Can I tell you something? Our culture won't tell you that. And every time you hear somebody loudly shouting something about themselves that you believe Christians should not support or endorse, the reason why they're shouting it about themselves is because they want to believe it, because their own culture won't tell them there's anything special about them. So listen carefully. While Christianity does not accept or endorse that which goes against the story God gave us, his love for you remains true and is limitless. If you don't know what your gender is, or you're pretty sure it shouldn't be the one that was assigned to you on your birth certificate, we'll talk about bodies. But I want you to know my Father adores you. If you're living out your sexual urges in ways that are not God's design for you, the motivation to find his leading is to know this. My God loves you. How do I know this is true? Because when God looks at you, he sees his own face. If that's true for anybody on the planet, it's true for every church member, even the, even the one who's having a secret affair. Even the one who in their heart is gossiping or envious or full of hatred about their neighbor. Even the tax cheat. Even the one who's looking on the internet at things they shouldn't be looking at when their spouse isn't around. When we act out of the wrong story, we hurt ourselves and we hurt our father. But it's because we act as if we belong to no one and we're accountable to no one because no one really is there to care. And I want you to know, we are accountable to someone because we belong to someone because my God wants you. 
Please hear this. The child sacrificing to Moloch world is the world Christ came to save. The same world that provoked his anger to cause a flood in Genesis 6 is the world, John 3 says, God so loved that when we were bitter enemies, he wanted you. And my favorite line is not that Jesus came to save the lost, although I love that line. He came to seek and save the lost. For a good man, somebody may spend some time looking down the aisle. For a righteous man, some might go climbing over the hills. But God went seeking after his lost sheep who ran as far and as fast from him as they could go because he recognizes such sheep don't know the story and they don't feel belong. You're here for a reason and nothing you do can change that. But can I tell you something? There is something you can do to realize that. I want you to think about this line. What is true in creation is realized in Christ. I want to say that again. What's true in creation is realized in Christ. If you want to know who God is calling for, the answer is everyone who can hear my voice. If you want to know who God wants in his kingdom, everyone who can hear my voice. But who announces I've been chosen, I've been called, I'm in his kingdom? Those who have accepted that calling and have responded to Christ with, here am I, you're my king, into your hands I lay my life. What's true in creation is realized in Christ. Ephesians 1, listen to how the church sings with excitement a statement that could apply to you. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. In love, in him, we were chosen, being predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. I want you to hear that. There are some Christians who believe that only certain people were chosen before the foundations of the world to be saved. I don't believe that. I believe God wanted every single person he made to be in his arms. So who are the chosen? Those who have said, I know the story and I've given my life to him so he can live out that story in me. Who could be chosen? Every single one. If you'll give in to him. If you'll let him tell his story in you. Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year, which means in February, we can still refer to a Christmas song. Maybe you know the song, O Holy Night. Have you ever thought about this verse? Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared. The incarnation, when God became man and showed us just how important we are. When God became man is when he appeared. And in that moment, the soul felt its worth. God made the birds, but he did not become a bird. God made the great sea creatures. He made the great land animals, but God became a human being. Every person made in the image of God. And that's why when they looked at Jesus, they saw themselves. And God said, good. Because that's what I see when I look at you too. I love this line in Hebrews chapter 2 and, and verse 11. The one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He wants to be part. He wants you to be part of his family. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, 
Paul says, you and I were made for a reason. We already saw that in creation. But those who are in Christ realize the full extent of what you were meant to be. What God intended for Adam and Eve went wayward. And those in Christ realize what was truly intended in creation. We are what he has made us, made anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us, so that we can live the life prepared beforehand, the way of life that was always our intended goal. I want to say this again. You are an original, and God loves you just as you are. He will take you as you are, but he won't leave you that way, because Christ is our original standard. And in his life, we find what it means to be who we are meant to be. I heard this to be a true story. I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, let's say it is. There were several different military branches that were at a high school. And they were each told that they would have 15 minutes to speak in front of the assembly to get students to sign up to be in their particular branch. The Army went first and went 20 minutes. Then the Navy went, and they went 20 minutes. And then, uh, see, Army, Navy. Air Force went. They stuck to 15 minutes, so there was only five minutes left. So the Marine got up there, and he spent two and a half minutes just looking at the crowd. And then he said, I doubt that there's two people in this room worthy to be Marines. But you two should meet me over at the table. Can you guess which line was the longest? When you have been told your whole life, what you've sensed your whole life is that there's no meaning, no purpose. I am an accident. I'll create my own meaning. You know how barren that feels. But when someone says you were made for a purpose, you have an identity, and I'm calling you to something truly great, something so great you can't even imagine it. I believe we want to live up to that expectation. And Christ stands here with his arms open wide asking for you to accept your true identity. If you'll give your life to him, this whole church family will be here to wrap our arms around you as you join us in the same journey to find our identity in Jesus Christ. You are wanted.